What's going on, guys? Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. So we're going to be talking about you know, the future of the cyber landscape, um, how we can make it safer. And obviously, that's a, that's a huge topic with a ton of different facets. Um, so I kind of wanted to start with you guys just briefly introducing yourselves and kind of talking about what, what part of that process you guys are each involved in right now. We can start with you, Mark. Hi, so uh, my name is Mark Fristo. I work at uh, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. It's so secure we had to say it twice. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we're the newest federal agency. We used to be called the National Protections Programs Directorate in the Department of Homeland Security. And really, our job at CISA is we like to call ourselves the National Risk Advisor. Uh, we have both physical security and cybersecurity elements. I'm obviously on the cybersecurity side in our threat hunting subdivision. So we, uh, our responsibility is really to help organizations when they either think they've had a cybersecurity incident or they've definitely had a cybersecurity incident. Uh, we have resources uh, available both in the federal and non-federal space to assist them with that and help them uh, get on the path to recovery. So that's, that's our principal purpose. All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Jonathan Lee. I'm the Deputy Chief of Risk Management at NGA. Uh, so we kind of sit in that space between cyber operations and mission where our job is to really balance security versus mission, right? Uh, so as a duty combat support agency and an intelligence community uh, member, we get to balance uh, policy from, from both, uh, both sides as well. Uh, so it's a full-time challenging job, and certainly with all the changes in technology, um, we're certainly very busy right now. And hi, I'm Nick Marinos. I'm from the Government Accountability Office. Uh, so I'm the auditor up here on, on the stage, and I'm here to help. Uh, I swear. Um, so GAO is a nonpartisan independent organization uh, within the legislative branch. So we work directly for Congress, uh, performing a, a wide variety of audits. Uh, the team that I work within is the IT and cybersecurity team. And we do uh, work that ranges from agency-specific reviews to government-wide. Uh, reviews of how federal agencies are working together, including with DHS in partnership with DHS, uh, to better protect themselves, as well as looking at issues related to critical infrastructure, cybersecurity, and uh, data protection and privacy as well. Perfect. Um, so before we look ahead, I kind of want to start by talking about how the government's doing today to kind of address the threat that we have. You know, at hand right now, um, and and I know Mark, we, we talked a bit about um, you know agencies within the federal government and then the state and local governments they're having a difficult time kind of performing the basics right now. Um, so I was, I was kind of hoping from NKIC, you guys are right on the front lines of kind of fighting some of the, the cyber threats that are coming in today. Um, you, you know, what does what the current landscape look like when you guys go in after, after an attack or you're helping people get ready? Yeah, so I, I think that the landscape is not uniform in any way. Sure, uh, sure. It's definitely hilly and bumpy. Uh, some places there are mountains. Um, you know, we find that most of the root cause analysis that we find from attacks are, are uh, come down to what we call the brush your teeth and eat your vegetables of cyber. So, you know, patching, credential reuse, uh, insufficient network segmentation. So the things we all have been talking about for a really long time and we know how to do, uh, but actually executing them in, in a, uh, a comprehensive way seems to be a, a real hurdle, right? And there's a lot of pressures and reasons why, uh, you know, that might be. But kind of implementing some of those things are, are, seems to be the hardest stuff. And our, you know, our adversaries are tuned to take advantage of that. So you know, we talk a lot about zero days and you know, fancy malware and all that kind of stuff. And don't get me wrong, that, that's, that's a risk. But uh, in reality, we're, we're struggling with you know, passwords of the word password is still a problem that we have in both the federal and non-federal space. So you know, some of these basics... Um, you know, they sound simple, but in reality, the adversary, there's no extra bonus points for the cool hack, right? Uh, your adversaries have bosses in PowerPoint and Spreadsheet, too. And so, you know, they use what's most effective to get in the environment, and this low-hanging fruit's what's, what's there. And, you know, we kind of, as, as defenders, are, you know, still struggling with that, and that's why they use those tactics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nick, I was wondering what kind of what you're seeing sure. from the... GAO perspective. Yeah, so GAO's been on record since 1997 highlighting cybersecurity as a, a government-wide high-risk area. So that, that's a designation for about three dozen areas that we think are, um, you know, concerns of waste, fraud, and abuse or have national security implications, which obviously cybersecurity falls into that category. So 22 years into it, this doesn't seem to be going anywhere anytime mm -hmm. soon off that list. Uh, in fact, to, to Mark's point, too, it's becoming even more complex. 
Um, and I think what we found in our more recent work is that you know, agencies are putting a lot of hard effort into this, but in a lot of ways, their challenges you know, are gonna be unique to them. Federated agencies are gonna have challenges in information sharing within the organization. Mm -hmm. So empowering a CIO or a chief information security officer with enough information can be very difficult if you're an organization of over 100,000 people, let alone four million within the Department of Defense. So, um, so we've seen that as, as one of the key issue areas. Um, having said that, you know, DHS with the, the, uh, the renaming of, of MPPD to CISA, the empowerment through a lot of the, the initiatives, I think those are promising things because I think we're also seeing uh, that leading towards um, the recognition that we're in this together. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, I think uh, there has to be willingness for those federal agencies to take good advice from DHS and run with it. Yeah. No, for sure. And the information sharing is something I definitely want to dive into. So, um, you know, CISA has kind of branded itself as this convener of cyber expertise, this person, that, this agency you could turn to to kind of, you know, answer the questions that you have, get the help that you need. Um, big part of that is information sharing. What are some of the barriers right now that you see in kind of the, the current information sharing landscape within the federal government, you know, with, with some, you know, groups outside of the federal government, that kind of thing? Yeah, um, I think that the... Um the biggest barrier that I see is, is kind of a cultural one, to be honest okay. with you, and that is that, you know, uh, a lot of organizations, there's still like a negative stigma to like being breached, right? No one wants to be called up to Congress or get a unpleasant, although many of them are pleasant, GAO audit, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and so they're, they're reticent to share information about, you know, what happened to them. And, you know, we are all in this together. And one of the things that's just is, you know, if you actually look at kind of our remit, you know, we don't actually have really control over anything. You know, we are, we are a convener, we, we, are, uh, we can help, but we, we can't actually control really mm -hmm. any of the cyber ecosystem in the federal and non-federal space. So, you know, we're trying to create an ecosystem where people are okay with sharing information. Like, if one of you gets hit with a, with a phishing email that's new and unique, if we share our information fast enough, and we can close the loop faster than the adversary, and everyone else gets that piece of information, the bad guy can't reuse that code. And if we can close that loop tighter, faster than they can redeploy it, now their cost goes way up. And you know, so if we don't actually like work together on this problem, we're all in it together. And my thing is, you know, everybody gets breached. Everyone in this room has been breached. You might not want to raise your hand. I used to ask people to raise their hand. And like half the people raise your hand. I'm like, either half of you raise your hand, or you know, the other people are lying. <laughs> right? Everyone gets breached. We need to kind of get over that as a culture. Um, and just so we can start talking frankly about that. It's not bad on you for being breached. It's going to happen, right? If you have an adversary that really wants to go after you as a target, they're going to get in. Let's talk about how together we can share, share lessons learned, ways to defend it, ways to protect, get better, and ultimately make, put the pain back on the bad guy. That's how we kind of win this battle in the, in the long run. Mm -hmm. So then kind of building on that a little bit, um, information sharing around the specific threats yeah. that people are facing. I know that's something that the intelligence community deals with a lot. Sure. Um, what does the process look like in there? I know that's been a, that's a big focus of the new, um, the NSA cybersecurity director is kind of building more pipelines and channels sure. for that sort of information sharing, but you know, where is it at now? Yeah, we've seen we've certainly seen some successes, and, and there's there's the continuous challenges of classification management, right? Of you know mm -hmm. who can we share what information with, or how much of the information can we share with whom? And, and a lot of it really does boil down to it, it's a cultural challenge, right? Um, you know, a, a lot in our world of, of risk management, that means reciprocity, right? So if, if mm -hmm. I perform an assessment and authorize a certain system in a certain way, uh, am I going to share that with you? Is it the whole body of evidence that I'm willing to share? Maybe, maybe not, because that's going to give you an indication of you know how is our entire enterprise secure, right? And am I willing to share that? And then what happens to that information once once you have it, right? Are you sharing with other folks? And and the concerns all boil down to like we are we should be one team, we should be one fight here, right? Like you said. Um, everyone here has been breached, and, and if you can stop a thing and share that information with us, well, then all of a sudden, you know, we've all been successful in, in deploying defenses against that. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, so this is kind of more for Mark, maybe. Um, so, you know, we get this information out there. Um, it's, it's readily available for state and local governments. Do they have the ability to make good use of that information? Like, even if it's shared, and... and well, I'll start with that, and then we can go from there. <laughs> so the answer to all good questions is it depends. Sure, um, sure. You know, different uh, organizations. You know, cybersecurity, from my perspective, and again, you know, I'm kind of the cybersecurity mop-up crew, so I, I typically see people after bad things yeah. have happened, so I'm a little biased. Um, but, uh, you know, different organizations have different focus on cybersecurity, and that tends to be the key, the, the key element. If you have 
uh, serious discussions in your you know, executive rooms or your boardrooms uh, about cybersecurity, if that is a focus of the organization, you can be successful in cybersecurity. I've seen little tiny water utilities with amazing cybersecurity and multinational oil conglomerates with terrible cybersecurity. So it doesn't really matter how big you are, it matters how much you're, you focus on it. So it depends on how much they can use it. Mm -hmm. you know, at CISA, um, we try and put out products and, and guidance and advice at sort of all the levels of maturity because there's some, there's some people out there who just really need some of the basic advice stuff and we try and get some of that out there. There's people out there that can use really advanced detection techniques. We try and get some of that out there. Um, you know, we're trying to work to the whole community because everyone's kind of at a different spot. Um, but state and local governments, I think, especially as mentioned on the, on the last discussion about ransomware, mm -hmm. um, I think ransomware uh, is really, there's a positive out of this, and that is that it's really waking up a lot of people to the threat that they have from information security and, and is putting a kind of a spotlight on some of these kind of brush teeth, eat your vegetables issues. Uh, so I actually think ransomware will help us kind of get that message through and get that prioritization. But again, it, it really depends on leadership, and, and every organization is a little bit different. Not for sure. Um, so, you know, CISA is kind of that convener you just said that, you know, you guys can't make anyone do anything, right? Um, is there a role for the federal government to kind of maybe not mandate that an organization does something, but, but really push them in one direction? Like I know um, there was a bill recently introduced to kind of open up um, the, the tools under the Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation Program to, to state and local governments. Like it, 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 would something like that kind of help I mean, raise the time? I, I think we, from a CISA perspective, we're looking to remove as many barriers as we can possibly remove, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, opening up CDM to a, a wider audience would be helpful, but just having a easier pre-made contracting vehicle to get your stuff isn't enough, right? You have to actually not have the resources to get, to, to get that stuff and then deploy that stuff appropriately. Most importantly, have people monitoring and operating the stuff. That's where we typically fall down is that we don't, we invest in, Blinky boxes, but not humans. And, and really, that's where the bang for the buck comes from. I always say, I'll take a, a trained analyst over a million dollars a year any day, right? And so, um, you know, we want to break down those barriers. And, and I don't know about forcing people to use stuff because every situation is right. different. Um, sometimes we get criticized for our, our um, guidance being a little too generic. Uh, but the problem is, is that we're trying to put out guidance that anyone can use. And so, therefore, it, by ne it necessitates some level of genericism. Obviously, when we have direct engagements, it's much more specific. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you kind of have to know your own environment and, and kind of do your own thing. And so, while we can break down some barriers, there's some things that are just going to be the responsibility of whoever owns that system or network. Mm -hmm. If I can pull on that thread a little bit, I mean, definitely as as a team now that's sort of charged with carrying out mandates, right? When they yeah. when they come out of like, hey, you must deploy X Y Z, folks look to us to say. Did they do it? And if they didn't, what are you guys doing about it, right? Um, in a previous life, I was a cyber defender, um, you know, more on the ops side, and, and I love that concept, right, of like, let's make everyone run Windows. Let's make everyone run this same endpoint security tool, right, because then it's uniform, and as a defender, much easier for me, right? But you come over to the risk side of the house, and like one, from day one, there's always going to be an exception, right? Like somebody's always going to run something different because of cost, schedule, performance, mission, there's all sorts of good reasons to do it, and it makes the challenges of, of mandates in whatever form they come you know, that much more difficult to, to implement, right? And so mm -hmm. I think when the guidance becomes less prescriptive, you're kind of honing folks towards, you know, have a solution that does X. Um, but the challenges for the cyber defender then is how do I support 10 different capabilities that all do the same function, right? How, how, do, we, how do we work through that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this, this puts an exclamation point on the complexity of the issue right now. So thinking about the critical infrastructure world, we've got 16 sectors that have themselves subsectors. And so you can go anywhere from a water treatment facility to a major electricity grid you know, provider um, to the financial services sector. You've got, with, even within those sectors, you know, mom and pop shops up to multinational corporations as well. So it does end up coming uh, down to leadership's interest in taking the issue seriously. And we have found that that generally happens after a breach has occurred, unfortunately. Um, so when we've done work in this area in the past, a lot of times we've heard some of the challenges out there end up being having the right workforce. You know, the workforce issue is still an issue, especially if you're talking about small municipal you know, entities that have you know, a part-time IT guy that shows up once a month. It's going to be difficult to implement things like the NIST cybersecurity framework, which is what makes the guidance that comes out so important. So 
Um, the previous speaker also mentioned the fact that you you could run out of money if you're going to try to you know to to you know fill up every security hole that you may have. So mm -hmm. risk management is really critical here. Risk management starts with leadership saying, okay, I recognize that I need information on what we're facing and what we're willing to tolerate. What's the risk that we're willing to accept and where are we going to put our finite resources to? Mm -hmm. So you guys all kind of mentioned workforce. It's something I want to dive into. And I know it's something that had been talked about earlier today, but um, how do you see the workforce challenge manifesting itself at CISA? We can start with you guys. And I know, I know DHS is implementing a new... Um, cyber talent management system yeah. to kind of streamline the process of bringing people on, but like, does that go far enough? Or how can other agencies learn from that process? Well, we don't know yet because we haven't implemented it yet. <laughs> True. Uh, come ask me when that's done. Although I think that you know, some of the workforce work and, and a lot of my, our team is, is closely involved in, in mm -hmm. that CTMS development because um, I like to say I'm at a job, you know, I'm primarily an instant response organization, right? And, I'd like to work myself out of a job. Like, that would be awesome. I'll find something else to do with my time. Uh, you know, if there are more people out there with the right skill sets, there would be no need for us. And that's, like, kind of the goal, right, is to remove our, our need. And, and the workforce development is probably some of the most important work that we do. But it's hard. So right now, uh, you know, you go to different universities, and obviously I do, I do a lot of recruiting. Uh, you know, you get very different things from different places. They all come out with cyber degrees, but doesn't really mean anything. We don't have uh, professional, we have a lot of certifications professionally, but we don't have like licenses like doctors or, you know, you want to go be a hairdresser. In most states, you got to go through a lot of training, but you want to be a cyber expert. Like all you got to do is put it on your business card and you're good to go, right? Uh, you know, this is, this is a challenge, right? Is that from experience? No. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> no, so, um, so the workforce development is the hardest part. And then for us, you know, recruiting and talent management is very tough. Um, you know, working for the government is not always considered the, the sexiest gig, and we can't pay as well. CTMS might help with that to some extent. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we don't have the same tools that private sector does, and we never are going to compete with private sector. Now, I have the adv advantage, in my opinion, that I have some pretty cool missions that people can work on, and I can usually get some really good talent that way. But, you know, it's, uh, we, we really like to go for junior talent, to be honest with you. Uh, do a lot of recruiting at schools, bring them in, train Train, 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 pay for classes you know, that are out there in the community, give them internal training. We have internal training curriculums and, you know, get them up to that competency level, uh, which invariably the senior manager is always like, well, what if they leave? Great. <laughs> right. If they leave now, there's one more trained, highly skilled analyst out there in the ecosystem who's going to cover down on that new organization, be it a federal organization or private sector. So, like, I want to actually kind of train them up. And if they leave. Great, because now that's we're, we're helping you. We're lifting all boats by doing that. But th that is the I think the talent, the, the personnel talent is the, the, is probably one of the biggest challenges that we've got. Mm -hmm. I'll just throw it. I I like your optimism, Mark, because <laughs> I you had me all up into the point of great. Uh, because I think you know that there that is the continued challenge. We we did work looking at, um, uh, you know, working with the chief information security officers across the major agencies, and that was really the number one was that we we hire these folks, we train them up. They become very competitive for the private sector. Yeah. Um, and that's reality. That's just going to continue to be the case. I think, and to the point of, of universities and, and reality, you know, seeing a lot of these academic programs, they're, they're definitely going through um, their own sort of a crisis of, of conscience and, and of identity in many ways because the reality is that the, the cyber workforce of tomorrow is going to look very different than it is today. If we continue to rely increasingly on cloud solutions, on you know, third-party providers <laughs> to really carry a heavy amount of our IT, well, in reality, then those individuals on the federal side are going to have to change their skill sets um, to be able to effectively oversee others who are doing a lot of the day-to-day -day activities, too. So I think where we're seeing the, the change has been in that respect, uh, working with universities to sort of recognize that actually risk management ends up being one of the key areas that they, they're starting to focus on. And I think that actually does make sense. You know, we do still need the technical um, individuals to be able to, to keep things well protected, but we also need people to help educate, like Jonathan, like help educate leadership on how to make the right decisions on allocation of budget. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to just pull a little bit on that thread. So like when we're recruiting, one of the things that we look for, one of the things we're trying to break in is like logical aptitude tests, right? You can have all the training and particular technologies and they're always gonna change, but if you think kind of right, that's gonna have longevity, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's one of those things where, again, it, it's about investing in people 
really helps with, with that piece. Sorry, I, I cut you off. No, not at all. I, it, one of the biggest challenges that it, we particularly deal with, and I'm sure you guys deal with it in Elements as well, is like, how do you pitch working in a cleared environment to a college student, right? Like, you know, you've got that $800 <laughs> cell phone, right? Like, just go ahead and leave that in your car, right? That's not going to work during the day. Um, and you're competing with tech companies, especially in this area now with Amazon coming, but also all around the world, like Google, you know, they're feeding you throughout the day, right? I mean, they've got kegs in the office. Like, we don't have those things in the federal space, right? So like you alluded to, it's an uphill battle from day one. You know, come work for the government. People are looking at you like, what now? Um, so so it's, it's critical, you know, cultivating the young talent. And, and I, I still believe pretty strongly to this day that, like, it is some of the best training you know, say you don't want to commit to a 35-year career in the government, like, that's okay. We shouldn't, we, we should not say, okay, well, we're going to focus our attention on someone who, you know, wants to be a federal civilian for life. Um, there, there's, there's gains to be had from hiring in the young talent, training them up, and, and, and then once they leave, now you've got a new opening to bring in, you know, the, the, the newest uh, graduate to, to bring new ideas to the organization. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, so I kind of want to shift gears a little bit, looking at some of the um, you know, more broad organizational improvements that the government can make and kind of you know, act on some of this information a little faster. Um, it, there are a lot of, when, when you're building a strategy around cybersecurity and then enacting that, there's a lot of, lot of people involved in it, a lot of leaders. Um, and it seems like you know, there could be some inefficiencies that, that come out of having so many cooks in the kitchen, so to speak. I was hoping you guys could speak a bit to that, like, you know, it, is there, what does the bureaucracy look like that might get in the way of the government being able to respond? Yeah, I, I think the thing I, I always go to in this is that we have too many CISOs in the government. We have too many CISOs. I think between me and, and you know, the top line of, of DHS, there's like six or seven CISOs, right? I mean, it's just a lot. And when you start to add that, and like I understand why they're there and the sphere of control is important, but it really gets in the way of setting strategic vision and so when you have all these people who have slightly conflicting guidance and opinions and, you know, it starts to create this big mess. And what happens is, is you get uh, organizational stagnation because you can't make any decisions and therefore you can't make any progress. And so I, I think some of it is that we just have, we, 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 we play kids soccer with this and we just kind of need to get like a special team together, get it done, set the, set the strategy and then execute against that strategy I think we'd be a lot more effective. I apologize if there's CISOs in the room, like, and I just said, get fired. Um, but, like, in reality, there's just, you know, everyone has to fight with 50 other people to make one change in their environment, and that it's just too burdensome. And our adversaries, I, I'm in a position where I get to watch the bad guys a lot, and they know that this is how this works, and so they count on it with their tactics and techniques. Like, they know that we have to go through change control boards, and we'll never be out faster than them. Well, again, we need to flip our kind of operational paradigm in ways that frustrate the adversary and impose costs on them. But too much bureaucracy. Yeah, and absolutely. I mean, I, I kind of a question back to that. Like, do you find uh, when you go into organizations, like, do they have a well-defined incident response team, and do they follow it? Uh, so um, after after Mark leaves, they do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, if they don't. There's definitely a finding we have. Uh, so, it, 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 again, it depends. I see organizations that when they have a cyber breach, like, there is a team, there's a plan, it's been exercised, you know, they know exactly who's got what role. The thing that, they, that I always find they miss is they, uh, everyone forgets their public affairs people. Your public affairs people need to be involved in your incident response plan because it'll come out at some point, so know what you're going to say to whom when. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, even, or, but some organizations have a, you know, this kind of goes back to security versus compliance, um, you know, if you, yeah, I have to have an incident response plan, check. I've got my incident response plan. No one's looked at it in five years. We haven't exercised it. So when we have a, an incident, it's got names of people on there that quit three years ago. And, you know, it, it co- becomes a real challenge. And, you know, obviously it's kind of a tactical organization. We, one of the first things that we do is kind of get over that hump and start to move things in the right direction. But, um, you know, it varies. Sure. Um, it- so getting rid of CISOs, that's a tough pitch to make. <laughs> is that something, you, is that something you've, you've talked about with people within DHS and other agencies? Or? Uh, yeah, to some extent. I, I think, you know, there is a, just, a, just a human tendency when we see a particular problem happens. We tend to solve a particular problem organizationally when sometimes that's just, we ha- it goes back to risk, risk management. 
not everything bad that happens requires you to have some type of overreactive change to it. You know, sometimes we have to accept some level of risk and be okay when that risk becomes realized. As long as we knew that the risk was there, understood the impacts of that risk and accounted for it, when it comes by, we don't need an organizational change to fix that one thing. And I see a lot of organizations, even post breaches, they create these you know, massive incident response teams sometimes that are the you know, size of our team. And in reality, they don't really need that, right? Because day to day, they're getting, you know, kind of low level cyber security issues. And like, you know, they, they need to size themselves to, to what their primary risk picture is, not to what, you know, we necessarily help them with. So there's just like a lot of overreaction, I think. Mm -hmm. So maybe just another perspective on that. I think um, I, I would agree overall, but I would say that it's more about the empowerment yeah. and the communication across. So thinking about the reality, we haven't talked about the chief information officer. Yeah. Well, you know, the chief information officer is by FISMA on the hook, right? right? The agency head delegates the CIO responsibility for protecting everything. If that CIO lacks awareness of who's buying what from an IT perspective, they're going to have a hard time figuring out whether that stuff is being protected as well. So I think what we found, too, have been challenges around the reality that the average tenure of a CIO is just hanging over two years. The average tenure of a CISO is not far behind as well. And so when you have a lot of um, you know, knowledge, wisdom that may have been there for several years and then go out the door, let alone if they started actually good initiatives within their agency and they leave, the real question is, okay, what happens next? And a lot of times the civil servants or those that have been around for decades are left having to figure out, okay, how do we move forward on efforts that we think are valuable if new leadership comes in and has a different idea? And just to mm -hmm. add to that, and, uh, so what I think is, it's, I've been, have been out of private sector for a number of years, but something I feel like is a more uniquely governmental problem is that when you have that leadership turnover, it takes typically a, a good amount of time to get a new federal leader in place. And there's a lot of, we don't want to do anythingness that happens because there's not empowerment in whoever takes the acting role. And even if they're on paper empowered, there's not necessarily cultural empowerment. Um, and so we, we, we waste potentially 12 to 18 months in kind of a stag stagnant place where, you know, we could have been making some level of progress because we're afraid when the next person comes in, they're going to make wild changes. And, you know, I think that that's a problem that I've seen with, throughout the government when somebody, you know, steps down, they have, we have a lot of trouble making progress in the intervening time. And then that person takes six months to get ramped up and then leaves in 12 more, right? Mm -hmm. And it just becomes a, a vicious cycle of, of stagnation. For sure. And I imagine um, in, inconsistent funding only makes that problem a little more challenging. Yeah. Um, it was, you know, what, what is, how, how, how does the government plan when we are going from CR to CR to CR? Poorly. You know, yeah. Poorly. <laughs> Well, forget CR to CR to CR. The, the base process is mostly one-year funding. Yeah. Yep. So how do you plan for a security project that's going to take you two years to roll out when you don't have certainty in, your, in next year's budget? And, and you know, you're precluded by law from like carrying money over from one year to the next year to, to, to execute that plan. It just it, it creates additional complexities that, you know, again, slow down progress in, right. in big ways. And it just, it's just the way... We fund things in the U.S. and there's ways to get multi-year money for big projects. Don't get me wrong, but if anyone's ever tried to get multi-year money, it's not particularly easy. <laughs> um, so it's you know we're just not necessarily set up for things that again in the private sector, you know they can make that conscious decision that they're going to have a multi-year investment and then carry it through. Part, mm -hmm. And then I'll just throw out the the reality that the government is not very good at spending the money. Not just yeah. not these guys. Not, not saying so, <laughs> but on IT projects in general. So let's go separate of the security issue. So IT projects that fail after billions of dollars are being spent, not to mention the fact that security is often an afterthought in those, those investments as well. So, you know, I'm, you know, I'm wondering what, what the perspectives from Jonathan and Mark are too, especially Jonathan, you know, from your role in how you guys get clued into some of those investments. Have you seen any good success stories out of that too? Yeah. So, so a couple of things on that front. I mean, I think the procurement process in general, like, once you've planned for it, right, just executing it is a tremendous challenge. It takes a ton of time, right? And so our, our shop has seen a lot of success in shortening the amount of security time within the RMF to, like, how long does it take to actually get an authorization? Um, but that doesn't actually matter on the other, like, to the, to the end user when it takes 9, 12, 18 months to procure the thing to begin with, right? So if we've shrunk our process to five weeks, that's, that's still, you know, a, a year and a half long process, right? Um, so... 
we've done, we've gone to great lengths to say, hey, come talk to us before you let the contract, right? Like, let's talk about what you're building. Let's talk about how we're going to want you to secure it. And we can get some of those requirements on paper at the beginning so we can speed things up once it's on paper. Um, but it's, it's a cultural challenge, right? I mean, very frequently, those organizations are still piped off from where we are in security, where they are in procurement, right? Having those conversations ahead of time, it's critical, uh, but it doesn't always happen. Yeah. Yeah, I think... Speaking of contracting, I think contracting is probably, so besides workforce, contracting is where we win the cyber war, to be, to be completely honest with you, because uh, a lot of the issues and challenges we have is that security, cybersecurity isn't brought up early in that procurement process. It's not yep. baked in. And then we recently did a string of incident responses that we, um, uh, across managed service providers that was putting government and private sector data at risk. And we found out that in a lot of the government contracts, there was actually no provision that would allow us to actually respond to the incident in those managed service provider environments. And so we're actually yep. working with GSA to kind of change the standard language to, to, to enable these types of things. But you know, had that been in place ahead of time, would have really streamlined a lot of these processes. And so contracting is you know, maybe not the sexiest topic, uh, and certainly not in cybersecurity, is actually where a lot of the actual work will get done that will fix some of these bigger problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in my opinion, we've got great industry partners, right? It's yeah. not that we've got bad vendors, right? We've, we've yeah. got a lot of great partners. We're not good at writing contracts, you know. And we yeah. and we opened up the session talking about like patch management, for example. Um, we, you know, where a lot of organizations, their goal is to patch within two to three weeks, which is not great, but the contracts that support these, you know, in, in, in some cases are 10 years old or, or, or more, and so the, contractually, they're patching once or twice a year, where our goal should really be daily or, or, or more frequently if we really want to get ahead of the adversary. So you're absolutely right. I mean, that's, it's where we win the war. In a lot of cases, it's where we're losing the war right now. For sure. Um, so we're kind of coming up on time, but I, I just wanted to get your guys' thoughts really quickly on the, um, the CMMC, the cybersecurity maturity model certification that DOD is rolling out, kind of getting at some of these issues. Um, is that, I mean, do you see that as, um, you know, does that totally solve the problem? Um, and is that something that, that agencies outside of, you know, the, the defense and national security space can start, you know, looking to, to kind of improve it? Good question. That's for you, you John. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's... Duty guy. Right. Um, so to directly answer your question, no, it doesn't totally solve the problem, right? Because... Because... There's no silver bullet. Right. Um, I, I think it's a step in the right direction, but um, it, it's going to take a lot more. I mean, anywhere where, where you can start to build in uh, you know, more requirements that raise the awareness of, of those that are interested in doing business with the government has to also you know, be paired with raising the awareness and the education of those individuals that are going to be responsible. So a lot of times procurement and the Office of Procurement gets the short, short end of the stick when it comes to the training. Well, the reality is we need an entire workforce to get smarter on cybersecurity to be able to implement something like that. Sure, sure. Um, so I think we have time for maybe one audience question, if anyone has anything. Oh. Hi, thanks. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, going back to what the last speaker was talking about a little bit, I'm oh, sorry, um, <laughs> Mike just came on, uh, which was the idea of ML being used uh, both as a defensive tactic but also being used increasingly for exploits. Um, that was on the private sector side, obviously, but I wanted to ask you on a government side, how are you seeing the opportunity and use of machine learning for being able to react more quickly to attacks, and do you think it can be advantageous from a government perspective uh, on developing exploits uh, on the other end of the spectrum? So uh, I'll speak to the defensive application. So uh, for sure, every tool has its place, and you can use it in machine learning. It's just another tool in the toolkit. It's frankly... it's Nothing particularly special, in my opinion. It's just a progression of, uh, you know, technology as it moves on. But in order to actually get there, we have fundamental things that we need to cover down on before we can actually execute that, right? So we run into challenges in just instrumentation and host-based, uh, you know, EDR tools not being deployed across the federal space. And so if you don't have good data to train your models, uh, putting machine learning in on top of that isn't going to actually solve anything, right? And so... I think that we sometimes get uh, attracted to the kind of newer technology that does have some baseline requirements. It comes back to education about senior leaders. You know, they, they hear about these things and they want to be cutting edge, but you know, there's prerequisites to those cutting edge technologies. And if you don't have those, you're not actually going to get a lot of value out of that new technology. And in my experience, again, 
a little biased because I'm you know, generally helping people when they've had a problem. Um, it's that fundamental stuff that's still what's broken and what our adversaries are, are, are exploiting. All right. That's all the time we have. So, uh, guys, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.